Phil had this great idea to tell the parable of the prodigal son as a parody of the Wizard of Oz. Something Phil is really good at is finding a carrier, um, a, a world or a, or a context that can carry a really important story so kids can get it. What I set out to do wasn't to tell the story of the Wizard of Oz, but was actually tell the story of the prodigal son. And that's where it started, which is you know, probably one of the two or three most powerful stories in the Bible. Um, but we hadn't told it for kids because, number one, it's, it's not all that fun for a kid. And number two, it's really, really short. And that's when it occurred to me that the structure for the parable of the prodigal son was almost identical to the structure of, of Frank L. Baum's classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz! There it is! The Land of Oz. Funnest place on Earth. It'd be really easy to get lost in the Wizard of Oz because it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of places to visit. But we are telling the story of the prodigal son. We are telling the story that is Darby's story about going away and then coming back home. My favorite part of the film is the ending. The shots where Dad sees Darby approaching and the look on his face. And then as Darby's walking up the street, we see Dad just running towards him with this reckless abandon. I think it's really meaningful and really special to see the way that the father reacts and to think that, that that's the same way that God looks at us when we come back to him. My son, don't just stand there. Get a cake, get ice cream. Go rip one of those big bouncy castles. We're gonna have a party. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah. Get away. So in the original Wizard of Oz, it was set in the real world, Dust Bowl era, sepia tone, black and white, you know. And so in ours, it's a Veggie Tales version of that same kind of thing. And it's instead, in CG and in um, brightly colored CG, bleaching it out to black and white is not going to be very entertaining. But we kind of made it somewhere in between. To me, the importance of the floss and the bathroom tissue and all that, I think it just sets our world up to be one of farce and silliness and, and real fantasy. You, you got to make sure the floss is right before picking it, or it's it's just um, real bitter. I worked some elements like that, kind of bizarre fantasy elements, even into the real world, for no philosophical reason, mostly just because I thought it was funny. Is it, boy? Tornado! Growing up in Colorado, there's not many tornadoes. Then I moved to Oklahoma. Tornadoes are really frightening. Very, very scary. I had to hide in my grandparents' basement once when a tornado came through Muscatine, Iowa. What was important to me uh, and to our art director, Joe Spatterford, is that the, the tornado felt really cartoony. <laughs> got this twister coming we needed some intense music but at the same time we don't want to get too intense and we want to keep some of that hollywood magic to it so it's got some of the old-fashioned string runs uh, just those sorts of things that help to convey the, the seriousness of this but at the same time it's, it's not uh, so overly dramatic every song in the show is fantastic um the Ha 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 song in the park is absolutely my favorite. We kept writing that, and as we would get to the end, the director would keep saying, oh, let's make it a little faster. Let's let's get it even faster, even faster at the end, to the point that we, we could barely sing it in laying down the, the, the tracks to record to it. It was like, whoa, that's just about impossible. Again! <laughs> Bill came in with the script. He had some real clear ideas for some of the songs, and um, some of them sounded uh, like Wizard of Oz songs, some of them didn't. And we were trying to find that mix of, okay, we want to make it f be a parody of Wizard of Oz, but we want to tell our own story also. Look, there he goes! My lord, yellow beetle, happily hopping his way down the road. My lord, yellow beetle, down the land of Oz. In the case you didn't get that, it's yellow McToad, which happens to rhyme with yellow brick road, but totally different thing. Mike said, well, we can't just follow Yellow Brick Road. We need to do something silly there. And so he kind of figured out what sounded like Yellow Brick Road and ended up with Yellow McToad. Uh, and then our concept artist, Chuck Wolmer, got a hold of the character and turned him into the kilt-wearing Scottish uh, old toad that we see today. In the old film, Wizard of Oz, those, those people went through some terrible times. The, 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 the makeup they would react to with their face. But, you know, 
uh, Lunt, Larry, and Pa had it pretty easy. Pa Grape had to come in like at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, two days before he was supposed to shoot, uh, to get flocked. Uh, Lunt actually enjoyed the burlap. He thought it was a good look for him. <laughs> and what about you, sir? Well, I just... I just want to do whatever I want. It was great to, for me as a director to get to work with Lisa. She brings an incredible sweetness and genuineness to Darby or to Junior. Uh, whenever she performs him, for example, uh, when Darby says in, in Wizard of Oz, what seems to be the problem? Um, that line could be delivered kind of in a really flat way, but when, as she was uh, in the booth, it, it made me think about way back on um, Are You My Neighbor? when Junior gets to the spaceship and he says, what seems to be the problem? What seems to be the problem? The problem, as you can see. I'm just thrilled with what his character is like. You know, he's got this charm and he's really, you know, you really root for him. Even all the while, while he's kind of being a little bit whiny and, you know, kind of going off and, and really being a kind of a bad character, you know, he's doing some really bad things. And ultimately, you know, what Lisa brought to it is this real charm, you know, that you just go with them. You're like, oh, buddy, don't do that, you know. Hurry up, boys. Tarnation, Tutu. You must be the slowest dog in Kansas. Is Tutu a dog or is he a pig? That's um, one of those big, you know, life life questions. Does, does the dog appear as a pig to us or does the pig behave as a dog for the people in the story. We're going to let you decide that. Kids, you choose. Pig, dog, it's either way. So during the production of Wizard of Oz, Mike Naraki has been away directing the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything, the VeggieTales movie, and yet we found ourselves in need of a silly song. Meanwhile, our producer Chris Wall had been given a children's CD called Slugs and Bugs and Lullabies by a couple of uh, Christian recording artists here in Nashville, Andrew Peterson and Randall Goodgame. I said, Brian, these guys are really funny. Um, we should think about maybe see if we can call them up and, and do some silly songs. And so they came in with two songs and played one of them, and it was Monkey. I thought the song was really cute, you know, and I was following along. And then there's this turn in the song, because at first you think Bob doesn't get it. And then you realize that Larry's the one that's off. <laughs> we laughed hard. And we said, that's it. That's the new silly song. Really, it's, it's, it's semi-revolutionary. I think we're putting some new ideas into kids' minds for ways to classify life. If there's a tail, it's a monkey. No tail, ape. It's easy. And that simplifies life so much. And that's what people are looking for today, a simplicity to life that we lost, I think, in the 60s. But now we have it back. Larry, this is a disaster. <laughs> it's a monkey. We realized that you can't really do a parody of The Wizard of Oz or, or a tribute to The Wizard of Oz, which is really what I think this show kind of ends up being, without having Over the Rainbow. So the producer of the film calls me up and says, we're going to use uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow under the closing credits. We felt like, man, it'd be really great to get that song in there. You know, it's a really fun song. I think it'd be funny if we do it just the way it is and just have Mr. Lunt sing it. Because nobody can do Judy Garland like Mr. Lunt. Stop. He's got a shot at stardom with that tune. I think it'll become his um, if you can get past the, the cracked notes and the mistakes and the straining. Tell my mom I'll be right here. It'd be easy in this story to get stuck in telling this really important story and lose the fact that we need to be having fun the whole time we're doing it. I think when VeggieTales is at its best, we speak to the whole family, and I believe that this show really does that. And I, I hope that uh, families are able to use this story as, as, as a way to teach a lesson in their own home and have fun uh, along the journey. It's time to see the wizard, the wizard, the wizard of Oz. We'll get rising in Scabot. You'll have some fun, you want some more. It's time to see the wizard, the wizard, the wizard of Oz. We've wanted to tell the prodigal son story for a long time, 
but have just had before now had never really found the right vehicle to tell it through. Uh, so we were excited to be able to finally get that lesson and that nugget out there for people. Things will happen where you will think, oh, wow, that's the worst thing I've ever done. Does God still love me? You know, will my parents still accept me? Can I come home? Can I come back to God after doing something like that? Junior leaving his dad, Darby leaving his father and saying, no, I want to go out and try it on my own and realizing he can't and will, will my dad ever take me back? And, you know, that's, a, that's an underlying fear or question, I think, for a lot of us. I did something wrong. Will I still be loved? Will I still be accepted? Can I be forgiven? Not only by our earthly family, but obviously by our God. And uh, that's the importance of this story is that, yes, he always accepts us back with open arms. One of the things that has always been about that Phil and Mike first set out to do is to say, in a world that doesn't believe this, God made you special and he loves you very much. And we've talked a lot about how kids are made special and this story focuses on and he loves you very much, you know, really in its essence. Because it's saying that there's a God who loves no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, he will always take you back. We really want to instill in kids before they hit that point, before you do that first thing that really makes you question whether you can be forgiven, um, that there is no limit to God's love, that his ability to forgive us and to accept us and to love us is infinite. And if we can get that into kids when they're four or five, you know, by the time they're 10 or 11 or 12 or 16 or 18, you know, and actually doing the things or having the experiences that make them doubt, they'll be set. Now I'm somewhere the Four main characters in the movie are all pursuing what they want most, which in this is, is fun or food, it's, it's pleasure. It's really the pursuit of a life of pleasure, which in our culture today is, is what probably eight out of ten Americans are pursuing. The more you get into it, though, pursuing pleasure almost never results in what we really want, which is peace and joy. You know, fruit, fruit of the Spirit, which comes from a pursuit of God, not a pursuit of pleasure. So it's, it, even though it's not the main storyline of The Wizard of Haas, it's a very significant subtext. We absolutely don't have anything to say against theme parks by any means. It's not the park that was the bad thing, it was what he did to get there. You know, I think that um, the Bible and God is so full of timing. You know, he says a lot about this is the time, there's a season and a time for everything. Much like the prodigal son story, it wasn't that him taking it as inheritance was bad. That's what an inheritance is, you take it, right? He took it at the wrong time. He got selfish and decided this was the time to do it. I'm gonna go do this thing for myself and he took off with it. Fun is not bad in small doses. Uh, changing your life so that it is organized around the pursuit of fun is a really, unhealthy way to live. It's time to help people customize and save with Liberty Mutual. Joe Spatterford. He's a concept artist at Big Idea. His job is to create many of the places and characters in our shows. Today he's going to show you how to draw Junior Asparagus as Darby. Hi, welcome to The Wizard of Oz, How to Draw Darby. Now I'm Joe Spatterford, the art director of this film, and uh, we're going to draw Darby. Now Darby's Junior, but dressed up to look uh, a little bit like Dorothy, only no ponytails. Um, Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to Go ahead right at it and uh, and draw Darby and Junior mixed into one. The well, first thing we're going to do, we're going to break down big shapes. He's a, he's a cylinder, but for this case, we'll just draw a square. We'll indicate where the, where the top of his, yeah, it's kind of like this uh, clump on the top of his head of, uh, of smaller uh, little circles because he's an asparagus and that's what asparagus have. And then I'm going to indicate with a, a bit of a triangle and also actually think of it more as a cone shape that, that you would see 
on the side of the road, one of those orange cones, just indicating what his hat would look like. And his hat actually has some dimples in it too, which is a little bit like Minnesota Cukes hat. Okay, so that's that's we're just gonna block in real roughly the, the way his hat's gonna look. And you can actually draw through the back of his hat just to make sure there's enough room. Okay, now I'm gonna draw a center line. And the one thing we need to know about uh, about Junior is that um, his eyes are big on his body. Okay, so I'm gonna, his eyes are pretty big. Now I'm gonna draw, indicate his nose. His mouth kind of slides off to the side a little bit. So I'm gonna indicate that. I'm gonna draw two triangle shapes. His shirt has got a little bit of an S shape to it. He's got suspenders, which are square shaped. Just put a little circle. And then we're going to indicate the circles on top of his head. Okay, now we're going to go into his eyes and just make two ellipses, which are circles that kind of tilt inwards a little bit. And I'm going to draw two other little circles in there to show highlights. All right, so now that's the basic building blocks of, of, of the character. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to treat it a little differently this time around. I'm going to start coloring. Take this green and go right into his body. I'm gonna draw everything that I know is green. Just make it all green. Then what you can do is you can take a lighter shade of green and go right on top of it. And you can even get fancy and add a little bit of a blue so you can create a shadow side to them. Which I'm probably actually going to put a little bit of green on top of that too. So hold on. I'm going to draw this blue in there first. It looks weird at first. Trust me, once you start getting the blue on top, or the green on top, it makes a lot more sense as to why you're doing it. If it's looking a little weird right now, it's okay. Because I'll show you something we're going to do in a second here that's going to make it come together. Now I'm going to take some blue and go into his shirt. Now, he's got these checkered, this checkered pattern. Kind of like Dorothy had a checkered outfit on. Suspenders are a red color. So I'm going to take a red. Draw that right in. Now I'm going to actually take an orange and a yellow. Put those in there. All right. So I think we can get a little bit more red with that suspender. Just going to go and get a nice yellow kind of color here. Go over the whole thing. You're going to use a lot of crayon up on this guy. You can hardly see this, I know. I'm actually going to go with a little bit of a darker orange.
Okay, so we got the orange in there. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to push it a little further just with a, a little bit of a brown. Now actually what we can do, we'll put a little bit of a brown up there too, and we're going to throw that brown into that hat band he has. that are kind of a blue color here. Blue. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to bring everything together with a nice black line. I'm going to bring that, going to bring in his eye shapes. out his nose the underside of his shirt his pants that big smile that Darby has especially when he sees the land of Oz Oz. <laughs> gonna get some of these circles in here that we were that kind of got lost when I colored it dark. I'm gonna draw some of these flary shapes that are in the hat. Let's do some zigzag lines. Okay, now just to finish it off, I'm just gonna take a little bit of a blue shade. Gonna put it on the side here just to Make him pop a little bit. And put a line down the middle just to show the middle of his eyes. And as always, we're going to sign our name to it. Joe Age 29. Next time you guys see me, it'll be age 30. So thanks again, and I appreciate you guys watching. I hope to see you again next time, and keep drawing. Chuck Vollmer, he's a senior concept artist at Big Idea. He paints many of the beautiful backgrounds you see in our shows. Today he's going to show you how to draw Larry as the Tin Man. Hi, I'm Chuck Vollmer. I'm the senior uh, visual development artist here at Big Idea. And we're going to do a how to draw today of Larry as the Tin Man. So I hope you have your crayons and pencils ready and we'll get started. Normally when I start drawing Larry, I like to start out with just a general oval shape, it's, it's usual oval cucumber shape. I stay fairly loose right now and light with my, my pencil marks. I try not to get too dark right away and uh, we can get darker as we finish, uh, finish him up. Uh, I like to put down a, a center line down where the middle of his face will be. And this just kind of helps me with the uh, placement of his eyes. Put his eyes in. And Larry's eyes are basically just larger ovals. You get the smaller ovals for his pupils and then the larger ovals for the whites of his eyes. 
and his nose sits right in here between the two ovals of the whites of his eyes. Now, Larry is a tin man, has a longer nose. He's got a piece of tin or like a small tin funnel that sits on his nose. And it's kind of a triangular shape and it has a few seams in it like this and just below his nose is his mouth we're going to make Larry smile put in Larry's tooth it's basically a square shape like so and Larry's a tin man. He's got a piece of metal that looks like a large metal jaw. So we're going to put that in it. It sits just below his mouth. And we kind of make it kind of a curved shape. It kind of comes up like a jawbone. Like so. The main suit that Larry's wearing as the Tin Man is basically a pot belly stove. And so we're gonna draw kind of a circle shape around his midsection. Like so. And this is the basic shape of the pot belly stove. And it flares up a little bit in the back. Like so. And this is kind of like the collar in the back. Bottom, we have a bit of a, a base from the stove, and it just wraps around the bottom of the circle shape. And then we have a little bit of Larry sticking out the bottom. Now, in the middle of the pot belly stove, we have the little door, and the door is kind of a curved square. It's got slightly curved on the sides and on the top. And we can put some little squares here on the side to indicate the hinges. And then the put a little handle in here. And a couple little vents. Again, just little oval shapes. bottom of the pot belly stove we have some small leg shapes it's kind of like a circle and a circle you got the larger circle up top with a smaller circle as the actual foot of the stove so we can do that again over here and now we need to put the hat on it and the hat is like a tin funnel and we'll start out with a circular oval shape tilt it off to the side just to give him a little character. Well then gonna put in kind of a triangle shape. Like so. And, and then the little spout for the funnel. So there we have his hat. And then we'll add the little finger piece for the funnel. Now we have everything kind of roughed out. We've roughed out all the general shapes and what they are. And now what we can do is, you, if, you, if you have your box of crayons with you, we can take your crayons and we can start going in and putting in the details and darkening things up. And then we can start to color it. So what we can do now is, again, I like to kind of start in the same place as I started the line drawing. We'll go in and we'll darken in his, his pupils. Lightly go in, bring out his eye shapes a little bit more. We can go in here on the under part of his nose, we can go a little darker. And then on the top part, 
maybe just a little lighter. And that's going to help you give you a little sense of, of top and bottom. What we'll do now is we'll go ahead and put in the seams and the nose. We're going to go ahead now and outline out Larry with our crayons. We can start adding little details. As a Tin Man, we actually painted a seam on his body to make him feel more metal-like. We can add that as well. And on his jaw, we can go ahead and add the bolts to his jaw piece. Start on his pop belly stove part of his body. you've got them completely outlined just the way you like you can then go ahead and start taking some colors and filling them in and this is where you can really have some fun and loosen up a little bit and really add your own creative touch to it because he is tin I'm going to make him mostly silver gray here can go right on top of the lines you've already put down it won't hurt anything and I'm also going to add a little bit of orange just to kind of indicate maybe some rust because he was outside and he was all frozen up because of the rain so you can kind of add a little bit of orange or yellow if you'd like just to kind of give him that little bit of a rusty feel you can use all kinds of colors a little bit of blues in there, that'd be fun. You can go back in even with the black if you want, just to add some shadows if you'd like. few shadows here, a few more places, and I think that'll do it. Well, thanks for joining me, and I hope you'll come back again soon sometime and draw some more with us. Hey, congratulations, you found one of our Easter eggs. This is Brian Roberts, and I wanted to share with you some clips that were created during production of Wizard of Oz. Well, we have a lot of singing and dancing in this show, and so we, for the first time, actually did some choreography planning. And these clips you're going to see are of Jared Matthews, who uh, works with us on our live shows, and that's how he knows how to bounce like a vegetable. Uh, and so this is Jared doing some videos to send to the animators to show them the choreography we'd like to see in the final show. Enjoy! His name is Darby, and he's our hero. His name is Darby, and he's our hero. I like my Darby, but I'm no hero. Like being a Darby, or I'm a big hero. His name is Darby, and he's our hero. He sweats across him on his body and pulls him on chair in the eyes, so lift him up and start him high. Find up his head. Take three of Andrew Peterson and Randall Good Game uh, performing a 
a pitch version of if it doesn't have a tail it's not a monkey so the opening scene is uh a jungle scene larry appears he's wearing a safari hat and Bob's standing beside him wearing a photographer's vest and holding a camera, and they're out like on a safari. Uh, Larry says, Hi, I'm Larry, here with my gaffer, Bob, on the trail of either a monkey or an ape. Uh, Larry, what's a gaffer? I don't know, but it's like a cameraman or something. Just be ready. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. Even if it has a monkey kind of shape. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey, it's an ape. Doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. Let's see if we can catch it on the tank. You can very plainly see if it's a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey, it's an ape. There it goes, there it goes. I don't know. I can't tell if it's a monkey or an ape. Larry looks at the cameras if Bob should know this by now. It's very simple. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey, it's an ape. Booga booga, isn't that a monkey? chewing some grass <laughs> and uh it looks, we, it looks up and looks at them and it swishes its tail and larry gasps and says oh, it's a monkey and at the bottom of the screen is flashing the words not a monkey not a monkey <laughs> not a monkey <laughs> uh <clears throat> larry that's a cow not a that was exhilarating let's find more if it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. What a simple and distinguishing trait. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. If it doesn't have a tail, it's not a monkey. It's an ape. Larry, you don't have a tail. I don't? Nope. And neither do I. I wouldn't be so sure about that, Bob. What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. And then they turn to walk away, and we can see that Bob has a cut-out tail that is taped to his back. Ha, 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 ha. Party Okay. <laughs> the end.